So I've often felt that if I was doing this back in high school, I would have talked about two things, Silent Hill and Nine Inch Nails. And I've talked a lot about Silent Hill, so here we are with Nine Inch Nails. Pretty Hate Machine is a super interesting record because it's music from the past, obviously. Obviously it sounds like the 80s, yet at the same time it sounds like they were trying to imagine what the future of music would sound like. Whenever I listen to this album it reminds me of Batman Beyond, specifically those club scenes, right, with the giant lava lamp and everything. Pretty Hate Machine is an album that sounds like it should have been playing in one of those clubs. It's one of those things that is somehow both retro and futuristic at the same time. And this isn't a perfect record in the slightest. There are a lot of things about it that are goofy or cheesy or naive, immature. This album came out in 1989, and so it does sound dated at times. And even though Nine Inch Nails has made a lot of dancey tracks in the same vein as Pretty Hate Machine, I'm thinking of Discipline or Only or The Hand That Feeds. In spite of that, none of those tracks managed to sound like the album. And the reason why is simple, which is that Trent Reznor grew and evolved and moved past that. So a little bit of background about the band. The liner notes for this record say that Nine Inch Nails is Trent Reznor. And um, that's about it. Nine Inch Nails is very much Trent Reznor's band. And don't get me wrong, there are members who contributed to albums and live tours. There are long-standing members of the band, faces who you can associate with the band when you go see them live. But at the end of the day, Nine Inch Nails is Trent Reznor. He definitely got help from other people if you look at the liner notes, but this is very much his album. It's very much his project. Pretty Hate Machine to me feels like a record that is very cohesive in its worldview in a way that most other album debuts are not. Pretty Hate Machine feels like an album. It doesn't feel like a collection of songs. It feels like a single unit. There's a lot of anger on this album. There's a lot of angst. There's a lot of lust. There's a lot of desiring for love. So because of that, people have described this album before as goth nerd is horny and sad, which is 100% accurate. That's what the album is, is it's horny and it's sad and it's goth and it's nerdy. It's very much the kind of album that you want to play at night whenever you're not having a good time or whenever you're going through a breakup or something like that. I think it's a super fascinating album because you could throw it on at just about any kind of party and it would fit in. It is danceable enough to appeal to pop crowds. It's angsty and angry enough to appeal to hard rockers. It's moody enough to appeal to goths. If you have a bit of 80s nostalgia, you'll like it. So with this video, I wanted to talk about each song individually. And I just want to say this before we get into it. I'm going to try to avoid referencing other Nine Inch Nails works. I'm going to try to not talk about the Downward Spiral or Broken or the Fragile or Year Zero or anything that came after this album. I'm just going to try to focus on this album. The reason why is because there are a lot of recurring themes throughout the body of work of Nine Inch Nails. I could talk about how Nine Inch Nails' biggest song, Closer, only made sense to me whenever I realized that it was in the same vein as this album, Pretty Hate Machine. But the thing is that if we start doing that, then we'll be here all night and I won't have anything to talk about in future Nine Inch Nails videos. So without further ado, let's jump into the tracks. So the first song on the record is Head Like a Hole, which is a freaking banger through and through. It's kind of amazing because this is the band's first song on their first album, and it's one of the best songs they've ever written. Like this is literally the strongest opening track that they could have chosen. It has these really shrill, noisy guitars that are reminiscent of the Jesus and Mary chain. And Trent Reznor, throughout the entire album, delivers a very impassioned vocal performance. And honestly, I think the vocals are one of the biggest things that separate Nine Inch Nails from other industrial bands of the time, like Ministry or Skinny Puppy. Because Trent Reznor really had this crazy outlandish idea, which is, what if we made an industrial record with good vocals? I love industrial, but at the same time, there aren't too many bands with actual good vocalists. So Trent Reznor comes along and his delivery is just full of emotion and passion, and it's like, wow, this guy's doing something interesting. And I think that more than just other industrial bands, I think that just in bands in general. Trent Reznor's voice carries so much weight to it, and I think he's really excellent at being able to convey his pain and his desperation and his madness even, and his love and his lust and his agony. At his best, Trent Reznor's vocal performances carry the weight of an actor as opposed to just someone singing words. That's one of the things that drew me to Nine Inch Nails initially, just the fact that he is able to portray emotions so vividly. And this song, Head Like a Hole, really has everything that makes the album great on a single track. It features loud guitars, it features great vocals, and it features these really dark and heavy synths that you hear throughout the entire album. I think that the synths really carry a lot of weight and they carry a lot of this album because they just create this atmosphere of darkness. And that sounds silly, but the synths on here are much more sinister sounding than a Depeche Mode record, for instance. And I'm not saying that Depeche Mode doesn't have dark stuff, because they do, but at the same time, I think that the average Depeche Mode record is lighter than the heaviness of this album. The verses of this song are a song about God money, or the God of money, 
and essentially it's making fun of a love of money. The lyrics of the song seem to me to be critiquing people who are willing to forfeit their integrity in exchange for money or for power. Essentially, I think it's a song about resisting the urge to sell your soul to a false god. It's a song that's very much against the idea of giving up everything you are in exchange for temporary power or money or wealth. The chorus of the song goes, bow down before the one you serve, you're going to get what you deserve. In essence, I think that if you worship money or fame or power or whatever else, then it's going to come back and get you. But if you live your life in service to a higher ideal, then I think that things will work out for you. And I think that's what the chorus is kind of saying. But I do think it is saying it as more of a threat than anything else. You're going to get what you deserve. I think it's aimed directly at someone. In fact, I'm looking at the liner notes for this record and there are lyrics printed on the liner sheet that are not actually sung. And on the liner notes, the very last line of Head Like a Hole says, you know who you are. So I'm guessing this song is aimed at someone in particular. But I think it's incredibly bold to start off your career by saying, I'm not going to do what you want me to do. I see this as Trent Reznor saying, in essence, I'm going to make the art I want to make, I'm going to make the music I want to make. You can't control me, I'm not going to make the stuff you want to hear. And honestly, we're all the better off for him deciding to do that. Track 2 is Terrible Lie, which is a song about God. But unlike Head Like a Hole's God Money, Terrible Lie is a song about God. Like actual, like, like, God. Like track one, this song is super angry and it features some very dark and heavy sounding synths. And the lyrics to this song are essentially asking God why things are the way they are. Hey God, why are you doing this to me? Am I not living up to what I'm supposed to be? Why am I seething with animosity? And so there's this anger that's present, but at the same time there's this kind of desperation. And the anger doesn't come from a place of pure rage, it comes from a place of being scared. This isn't a song about being mad at God purely to be mad at God. I think you can tell that it very much comes from a raw emotional place. And you very much see that with lines like, don't take it away from me, I need someone to hold on to. And I think that's why the song is powerful to me is because it's not just like, hey God, I hate you, but rather it's something deeper and more intense. And it's this yearning to be comforted. It's this yearning to be safe. And the lyrics that really get me are, I'm on my hands and my knees. I want so much to believe. Because the way that God is talked about in Nine Inch Nails songs is very interesting to me. And I could do an entire video just on that, but I'm not going to talk about future works in this video. So I'll say this. This song feels like it comes from a very raw and honest place, a place of wanting to belong, but feeling like you don't. I think this song is really about not knowing who you are and struggling with that. This is also a song that the band plays live very frequently. There is a version of this song on their CD that they released in 2002, live and all that could have been. And it's much heavier, it's much more aggressive. And I forgot to mention it, but Head Like a Hole has the same thing. It has a live version on that album that's much heavier and more aggressive. Terrible Lie is a fan favorite and it's not hard to see why. It's really just kind of a banger through and through if we're being honest. Track 3 is Down In It, which features Trent Reznor pseudo-rapping. It's not really rapping, but it kind of is. He's more just kind of speaking quickly throughout the verses, and he's kind of rapping. I think this song kind of continues with the idea of not knowing who you are, but as opposed to just not knowing who you are, Down In It is more about taking in the worst traits of someone you know into yourself. As the song goes, I was up above it, now I'm down in it. Again, this is another favorite off the album, just phenomenal. Track four is Sanctified. This song features a kind of funky slap bass and some kind of funky guitars. Honestly, the more I read these lyrics and the more I read the lyrics to most of this album, they just seem to be songs about running away from yourself and running away from your problems and trying to hide in sex, using sex to drown out your problems and your issues. Which is really what the song Closer is about, but we're not going to talk about the downward spiral because that didn't come out for another five years after this album. But again, it's a song about losing yourself. It's a song about not knowing who you are or being tainted or polluted or ruined by someone else. They've kind of been reworking this song whenever they play it live. The 2013 version of the song sounds a bit different than the one he played on tour in 2018, which I'll link below. But really, this is a song about being trapped in a relationship and not knowing what to do about it. He doesn't like being caught up in this relationship, yet at the same time, he continues to go back to this girl, whoever she is. I'm just caught up in another of her spells. She's turning me into someone else. Every day I hope and pray that this will end, but when I can, I do it all again. Track five is Something I Can Never Have, which is a sad piano song. And again, it's another song about relationships. This time it's a song about missing someone and not being able to be with them. It's a song that really kind of focuses on the idea of not knowing who you are outside of a relationship. I made a Scott Pilgrim video a few months back and really it's about this sort of idea. It's about this idea that you have to know who you are outside of a relationship in order to be successful in a relationship. And if you don't believe me, listen to this song because it's about the opposite of that. It's about not knowing who you are because you are not in a relationship. It's about feeling like 
you've lost happiness without that relationship, feeling like you've lost your one shot. There are some corny lyrics on this. Gray would be the color if I had a heart, which is kind of goofy. But at the same time, I was talking to my cousin and I brought that lyric up to him. And he's like, wait, no, that one is kind of corny, but it goes hard because of that. And I'm like, you know what? You're right. You're right. It is goofy, but it's good because of that. And I feel like this album is cheesy and it's goofy at points. And it's one of those things where either you get into it and you love the album or you don't get it and you probably don't resonate with the album so much. But I really love that idea, the idea of wanting something you can never have. Because it's a feeling that I've experienced, it's a feeling that I'm sure many of you have experienced. It's not a good feeling. It's not a nice feeling, but I'm glad that Trent Reznor coined a phrase for it. Also on the band Still CD, there is an acoustic version of this that's really excellent. If you're already a Nine Inch Nails fan and you haven't listened to Still, do yourself a favor. It's one of the best things they ever put out. But again, we're, we're done with that. We're not talking about future stuff. We're living in 1989, pretending like this is the only album to exist. And also Disintegration by A Cure came out this year. Good freaking year for music. So if you have the vinyl version of this record, that's the end of Side A. Side B starts with Kinda I Want To, which is a song that Trent Reznor hates. I remember reading somewhere that he hates this song and he's ashamed of it, which is a shame because it's a straight banger. Honestly, this song is really goofy and silly, but I love it. It does some really cool left and right ear panning, like the song Peekaboo by Susie and the Banshees. Lyrically, this is a song that covers the same ground as Sanctified. It's just about knowing that you shouldn't be in this relationship, but wanting it anyway. Again, some of the lyrics to this are cheesy, like the chorus is really cheesy, I think. I know it's not the right thing, I know it's not the wrong thing kind of I want to. And I think the chorus is the worst part of this song, but I love the verses. I love the verses because of the panning. I love the opening lines to the song. I can't shake this feeling from my head. There's a devil sleeping in my bed. I don't know. I just kind of like it. I think it's cool. So yeah, kind of I want to kind of sucks, but at the same time, it's kind of great. I've always liked this song a lot, but Trent Reznor doesn't. And um, quite frankly, he's wrong. Quite frankly, it's a good song. It's cheesy and silly, but it's a banger. Track 7 is Sin, which is perhaps my favorite song off this whole entire album. This is a really awesome danceable track. Sin is another song that they play live regularly, and as with the other tracks, the live version of Sin is much heavier and more aggressive. And this song is awesome because it quotes Clive Barker, and I love Clive Barker. It quotes the story In the Cities, The Hills off the first Books of Blood record. Sorry, it's from the first Books of Blood book, not record. Clive Barker didn't make music, I think. I don't know, maybe he did. But Trent Reznor thanks Clive Barker in the liner notes for this, so I think that's pretty awesome. As I'm shooting this video, I'm realizing just how many songs off this album tread the exact same lyrical ground. It feels like most of the songs off this record are like, I'm in a relationship and I know I shouldn't be in this relationship because it's bad and it's toxic for me. However, I kind of like it sometimes. I actually love the lyrics to this one. I think they're just so catchy along with the music. You give me the reason, you give me control. I gave you my purity, my purity you stole. And if I read the lyrics past that, I'm gonna start singing them, so we're not gonna do that. Head Like a Hole is probably the best song off this album, but Sin is my favorite. Track 8 is That's What I Get, which is about feeling discarded and worthless after the end of a relationship. I really like it a lot. It's a very danceable, darker new wave track, which is really kind of a way that you can look at this entire album as just being a dark new wave album. I think that The Cure and Depeche Mode influenced this album just as much as Skinny Puppy and Ministry. And so is it correct to call it a new wave record? Probably not, but I think it fits comfortably in with those groups. This has maybe the cheesiest lyric off this album, which is, now I'm slipping on the tears you made me cry. But again, it's like, it's silly, but at the same time, it, it's kind of fun, so I like it. Track 9 is the only time. I'm not gonna lie, I don't really like the only time. It's okay, it's not bad, but at the same time, I'm like, the entire rest of the album is better than this one. There's a lyric where he says that the devil wants to F me in the back of his car, and I'm like, Trent Reznor, what does that mean? And by the way, Grandma, if you're watching this video, F stands for foot. The devil has a foot fetish, that's what it is. But it's like, yeah, what did, what did you mean by this, Trent Reznor? What does this mean? My moral standing is lying down. Honestly, that one's silly, but it goes really hard. It feels like a Queens of the Stone Age lyric almost because it sounds very playful, but it covers that theme again of wanting to lose yourself in another person and dedicating yourself to that person. It's very funny to me that this album starts off with a song, Head Like a Hole, which is about not giving yourself over to the false god of money, yet at the same time, all the rest of the songs are about giving yourself over to the false god of another person. Track 10 is Ring Finger, which I kind of love. If I was twice the man I could be, I'd still be half of what you need. That one's silly, but I freaking love it. The chorus to this one is really interesting. Ring Finger, promise carved in stone, deeper than the sea. Ring Finger, sever flesh and bone and offer it to me. I've never thought of it before this way, but I'm wondering if the Ring Finger mentioned is kind of alluding to the idea of marriage and being scared of marriage, being scared of that full commitment to another person. Because lyrically, it's just kind of, again, 
I want you to replace me. I want you to take charge of me and turn me into something else so that way I don't have to be myself. This is one of the most new wave sounding tracks off the record. It just has dark lyrics and so because of that it doesn't really fit neatly with new wave stuff. This is a song that if it had nicer lyrics it would fit very nicely in with Let's Go To Bed By The Cure. It just has that really kind of bouncy synth sound. But Ring Finger is just really excellent. I love it. So I have a theory about this album, which is that it was recorded by Trent Reznor when he was like 23, 24-ish. And so I think it's an album that if you discovered it when you were younger, if you were a teenager when you discovered it, then you probably connect with it pretty heavily. But I think that someone with a substantial amount of life experience may not connect with this so readily. Nine Inch Nails is one of those bands where you either kind of feel them and you love them, or you don't feel them and you just kind of like them. But really, I think that you have to deeply connect with Trent Reznor's lyrics, not necessarily for this album, but for something else in the Nine Inch Nails canon. In order to love the band, I think that you have to relate to his lyrics in some way, shape, or form. I think what makes this album so special is that even though I've poked fun a little bit at the lyrics of it, I think that many of the things that are discussed in this record are things that many people have felt. There are certain things I've felt that make me connect with this record. Trent Reznor has talked about how whenever he first started writing lyrics, he was aiming to write political lyrics like The Clash, but the thing is that he just couldn't get behind it. He couldn't sing them and be proud of them. And that's when he turned to his journals and he started pulling ideas from his own journals. He felt embarrassed to sing some of the songs because they were about his own feelings. He wasn't playing a character like David Bowie. He was just being himself. So I think most of the people who like this album like it because of its lyrics, not in spite of it, but because of its lyrics. And this album is called Pretty Hate Machine. And that is such an interesting phrase because I've wondered before, what does a pretty hate machine look like? And I think in one sense, a pretty hate machine can be interpreted as a phrase for someone who you are in love with, who you know is bad for you. At least after discussing the record, that's what makes sense to me. But really this is an album about love and relationships and lust and dealing with your self-worth, dealing with your sense of self-value. It's about many of the things that you struggle with when you're young. And so I think that's what makes this album special. So I wanted to throw some recommendations out there for if you like this album and you wanted stuff that's similar to it. And I don't mean just industrial. I mean stuff that is darker electronic or industrial music that is at the same time danceable or it's about relationships. Really, I'm focusing more on the dancey side of things. So because of that, I'm not gonna recommend ministry and also I just wouldn't recommend Ministry because I don't really like them if we're being completely honest. I know, I know, that's blasphemy, but I don't really care. Their first record's good. I like their first record. So anyways, here are some recommendations. I would recommend Kanga, The Black Queen, Crosses, Health, especially Rat Wars, their most recent album, which I did a video on. Greg Pucciato's solo stuff has some songs that are kind of similar to this, I think, like A Pair of Questions. Depeche Mode, I really like Some Great Reward. And of course, if you like this album, check out the rest of Nine Inch Nails' stuff. So thank you for watching. I love Nine Inch Nails, and I plan to do more videos on them in the future. It's kind of surprising that it's taken me 66 videos to get to this point, but I guess it's never too late to fix your mistakes. So um, thank you for watching. Have a nice night. Bye.